Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 134, Tannenberg. This week we look at the reasons the golden age of the Teutonic Knights came to an abrupt end at the beginning of the 15th century. It is a sequence of events that involves some remarkable Polish and Lithuanian princes, the Templars and, of course, the brothers of the House of St. Mary of the Germans in Jerusalem. Ah, and a very famous battle. But before we start, in the unlikely event you are unaware of it, the History of the Germans podcast and all its offshoots are advertising free, thanks to the generosity of our patrons and one-time contributors. I know, these inserts are irritating to some of you, but would you prefer me espousing the advantages of various crypto coins, a mildly dodgy online mental health service or a meal plan? I wouldn't, and so be so kind to thank George O, C.M. Bo, Fabian G and Katie, who are valiantly protecting us from those impositions, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash history of the Germans. Now, back to the show. Now, last week we heard about the great chivalric adventure holidays the Teutonic Knights staged for their wealthy aristocratic guests. These were nominally crusades against the pagan Lithuanians, but their military benefit paled into insignificance compared to the economic impact the free-spending tourists had on the older state. These Lithuanian crusades or Poisonreisen did serve, however, another important purpose, a purpose that was even more crucial for the survival of the order than the economic or military benefit. And that has to do with something that happened not in Northern Europe, not in the Empire, but way over on the other side of Europe, in Paris, in 1307. And that event was the suppression of the Knights Templar. Now, for those very few of you who may not have heard about that, the story goes roughly as follows. King Philip IV of France was short of money, due to the incessant wars with the English, or more precisely with his main vassal who also happened to be the King of England. Not only was he short of money, he was also heavily in debt to the Knights Templars. What he lacked in money, he made up for in ruthlessness. Now, some of you may remember episode 92 the papal epilogue. That was the story of the slap of Anani, when soldiers in the pay of Philip IV allegedly slapped Pope Boniface VIII in the face, and with that simple act brought down the whole edifice of the imperial papacy. Under French pressure, the popes moved to Avignon and came under de facto French control. Now Philip IV used the fact that he had a pet pope in Clement V to get him to issue an order to all monarchs in Europe to apprehend the Templars. The biggest hammer fell in Paris, where the Grand Master of the Order had his headquarter. He and his main officers were arrested and put on trial. They were accused of satanic rituals and various forms of blasphemy, including kissing a black cat's anus. Once duly condemned, they were burned at the stake and, most importantly, all their assets were confiscated by the Crown. As you probably know, pretty much any Weko conspiracy theory sooner or later traces their story back to the Knights Templar, their links to the Holy Grail, their Cathars, Rosicrucians, and ultimately the CIO, Albino monks, and God knows what other nonsense. No worries, I will not talk about that. Instead, we will look at the truly interesting question at the heart of this story. And the question is, why did Philip IV get away with destroying an organization that only 50 years earlier had literally been drowning in donations from extremely powerful men all across Europe and had been seen as a crucial component in Christendom's most important political project, the conquest of Jerusalem? Part of it was that the Templars had become filthy rich. At their peak, they owned 870 estates and castles across Europe, Moreover, they had become bankers who were best placed to transfer money across this vast network of commanderies. They also lent money to royalty and famously accepted the crown of France as collateral for one such loan. As so often with bankers, their willingness to lend to unreliable borrowers is regarded as avarice, rendering them evil in the eyes of many people. But that alone is unlikely to be enough. The knights' hospitalers, too, were extremely rich, as were the Teutonic knights. 
and the hospitalers in particular lent money too, admittedly on a more modest scale. So here's the question, why did the persecution of the Templars not lead to a persecution of the other two orders? The answer lies in their original purpose. The chivalric orders were founded mainly to protect the Holy Land. The Crusader state in Palestine had fallen in 1291, but that did not spell the end of all Latin states in the region. Cyprus was still standing, and that is where the hospitalers went, and then they conquered the island of Rhodes, which they turned into a massive fortress. They even maintained a foothold on the mainland at Halicarnassus, modern-day Bodrum in Turkey. And that way, they recreated themselves as the bulwark of Christendom against the advances of Islam. And that new purpose was enough to protect them from persecution. Now, what about our friends, the Teutonic Knights? They too had left the Holy Land, in fact even earlier than the Templars. But they could at least argue that they were engaged in crusading in the north, bringing pagans into the faith. But that argument was beginning to sound a bit hollow. Once Prussia and Livonia had been conquered and the pagan rebellions were suppressed, there weren't that many pagans left. Well, just the Lithuanians. And there was another problem. One may sometimes get the impression that the medieval theology was monolithic, with the Pope at the top determining what was right and what was wrong. But that was not at all the case. Even an overbearing figure like Bernard of Clairvaux had to face stringent opposition from the scholastics at the University of Paris, from Abelard, Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. Now it was one of these scholastics, Roger Bacon, a Franciscan friar and all-round fascinating individual, who took umbrage of Bernard's notion that the conversion by fire and sword was doing God's work. And he singled out the Teutonic Knights, saying that, quote, Pagans like the Prussians would become Christians very gladly if the Church would permit them to retain their liberty and enjoy their possessions in peace. But the Christian princes who labor for their conversion, especially the brothers of the Teutonic Order, desire to reduce them to slavery. End quote. In 1274, at the Council of Lyon, Humbert of Romans, the former general of the Dominican Order, made the point that, quote, the idolaters who still live in northern parts, the Prussians and those like them, may be converted in the same way as their neighbors, the Poles, Danes, Saxons and Bohemians. He means by missionary efforts. In any case, he goes on, they are not in the habit of attacking us, nor can they do much when they attack. And so it is quite enough for Christians to defend themselves manfully when they invade. End quote. Now if these arguments were taking hold amongst the members of the Curia, the entire existence of the Teutonic Knights could be in danger. Now around the time of the suppression of the Templars, these humane voices got support from Livonia itself. Remember that other than in Prussia, in Livonia, the bishops, in particular the Archbishop of Riga, were powerful. And so were the burghers of the great cities, Riga, Dorpat and Reval. And these different parties were almost constantly in conflict with the order, which occasionally turned into actual fighting. And in this struggle, the church authorities in Livonia sought support from the Pope, after all, the direct superior of the order. They accused the Teutonic Knights of all sorts of crimes, waging war against Christians, even the bishop himself, which was true, unwillingness to fight the pagans, burning their dead, killing the wounded and witchcraft, which wasn't true. But the most damning accusation was that they were hindering the conversion of the pagans by their savagery, cruelty and tyranny, as the Archbishop of Riga wrote. The Grand Master was summoned to come to the Curia to defend himself and his order. The situation was certainly precarious, but Pope Benedict XI decided that whatever crime the Teutonic Knights may have committed, it was more important to reconcile the parties in order to defend Livonia. So he replaced the Archbishop of Riga and sent a harsh indictment to the order, demanding that they sort themselves out. In response, the Grand Master ordered a sharp tightening of discipline, moved to Marienburg to be far away from any monarch keen on seizing and burning him, and began constructing a new narrative for the order's purpose. The story goes roughly like this. These pagans beyond the frontier, they aren't peaceful villagers who may be misguided but otherwise harmless. 
No, they are a terrifying foe who intends to break into the Latin world, forcing their faux religion on not just the recently converted Prussians, Estonians, Lets, Livs and Kurlanders, but were intending to push all the way west into Poland, the Empire and ultimately Rome itself. These hordes were the Lithuanians, but also the successor states of the Kievan Rus, and behind them, the Mongol Khans. It was they, the Teutonic Knights, that formed the bulwark of the West against this existential threat from the East. And to make the story stick, they needed to make these adversaries sound terrifying. As it happened, that wasn't that difficult. The Lithuanians had always been a worthy opponent, and there was a good reason why the precious crusading tourists never spent too much time in Lithuania itself. After Mindaugas had united the various Lithuanian tribes, the entity remained coherent, even though Mindaugas himself was murdered in a coup. The incessant warfare with the Teutonic Knights helped the Lithuanians to become an advanced military. They did, however, not copy the model of the armoured knight. Their cavalry tended to be lightly armed, which made them more manoeuvrable in the challenging terrain they inhabited. They took some inspiration from the Mongol horse archers, though they preferred spears to bows and arrows. The infantry adopted the crossbow from the Latins, but they were mostly free men and held in much higher esteem than infantry in the West, which was sometimes ridden down by their own side. Now this military prowess left them in good stead to acquire some of the successor states of the former empire of the Kievan Rus. In 1321 the Grand Prince Gedimas captured Kiev itself and as his successors kept pushing on, in 1430 the Grand Principality of Lithuania extended all the way from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Now as this went on, defeating and forcibly converting the Lithuanians became an ever more improbable prospect for the Teutonic Knights. And in a perverse way, that was to their benefit. Had they been successful in converting the Lithuanians, they would have lost their raison d'etre. There would not have been any more pagans to convert or to defend Christendom against, but they could have directed their forces against the principalities of Novgorod and Moscow, though these were less impressive at the time, Christian if orthodox and given to the Swedes as their special crusading task. So that event, the conversion of the Lithuanians to Christianity, did happen, though not thanks to the efforts of the Teutonic Knights. For that story, we have to go back again to the beginning of the 14th century and take a look at the other neighbour of Prussia, Poland. Now, before I do that, I have to ask my Lithuanian and Polish listeners for forgiveness. I am trying to get all these events right, but as I do not speak either Lithuanian nor Polish, I am reduced to German and English language sources. That means I may not get many of the subtleties and I will end up blanking out quite important events that do not directly affect the story of the Teutonic Knights. There are some excellent podcasts that dive a lot deeper into these stories and are done by people much more knowledgeable than myself. I will put links to those in the show notes. Now with that caveat, let's take a look at Poland in the 13th and 14th century. Poland had been founded by the Piast dynasty, Mieszko and Boleslav the Brave in the 10th century, and in particular under the latter had become a hugely powerful entity that amongst other things defeated the Emperor Henry II, as we talked about in episode 18. But after that, Poland, like so many other medieval kingdoms, went through waves of fragmentation and unification as possessions were split amongst sons who then vied for supremacy. One of their most momentous fragmentations happened after the death of King Boleslav Rymouth in 1138. Rymouth had five sons, each of whom was given a duchy. These sons in turn split their lands upon their death, creating even more and even smaller entities. In principle, the Dukes of Maropolska, Greater Poland, based in Krakow, were supposed to have some sort of overlordship over the others, though that was rarely of any practical relevance. The fragmentation of Poland left them extremely vulnerable to external threats. Some came from the west, namely from the Markgrafs of Brandenburg, who expanded eastwards and northwards into Pomerania and even took Gdansk in 1271. Another were the Bohemians who targeted Silesia and on occasion took Krakow. Then there were the pagan neighbours, the Prussians and Lithuanians, 
who had become increasingly hostile, to the point that the Duke of Mazovia called the Teutonic Knights in 1226, a story you are quite familiar with now. The real shock to the system came when the Mongols invaded in 1241. Though several of the dukes tried to mount some resistance, they were comprehensively defeated at the Battle of Lignica, Lignitz in April 1241. Though the Mongol invasion did not continue into Western Europe, Poland was not so lucky. They were attacked again in 1259 and 1287, sacking Lublin, saint Bitong, and even Krakow. By the end of the 13th century, the various Piast dukes realized that their existing structure was not sustainable. None of them was able to fend off any of those invaders on their own. Calling in the Teutonic Knights had only resulted in replacing the hostile, but ultimately not life-threatening Prussians, with a well-ordered, powerful, militarized state of the Teutonic Knights. The defeats of the Pomeranian dukes, who had supported the Prussian uprisings, brought home to them the relative superiority of the Knight brothers. What then followed was a protected process of reunification. It was in part driven by simply military success as ambitious dukes managed to eject the rulers of rival duchies. Then there was a lot of luck involved, as several of the dynasties died out and the last of their line took the enlightened decision to pass his lands to the most powerful of the dukes at the time. And one has to assume that to a degree the ruling families decided that they would rather submit to one of their own family than to some foreigners. Now, I will not go through all of them, but it's certainly worth to mention some. Premisel II had already achieved some consolidation by bringing together Wielkopolska, that's Lesser Poland around Gniezno, and Pomerania. He was the first ruler in a while who was crowned King of Poland in 1295. He had no male heir, and so his successor was Vladislav the Short from the line of the Dukes of Mazovia. Vladislav the Short was off to a difficult start. The King of Bohemia invaded, took Krakow and threw Vladislav out. When the King of Bohemia, Wenceslas II, was crowned King of Poland in Gnezno in 1300, the cause of the Piast dukes seemed to be at their lowest point. But in 1306, Vladislav the Short was back in Krakow. He had become a key beneficiary of a grand papal strategy to bring the kingdoms of Central Europe, Hungary, Bohemia and Poland under new management. In Hungary, the dynasty of the Premislids was replaced by the Anjou, the French dynasty that had already taken the kingdom of Sicily from the Hohenstaufen on the Pope's behalf. The plan was to also replace King Wenceslas III in Bohemia and in Poland. Now that Bohemian project did not work out, but with Hungarian help, Ladislaus the Short was able to throw the Bohemians out of Poland. In 1320 he was solemnly crowned King of Poland in Krakow. His son, Kazimierz the Great, took over in 1333. Under his long and successful rule, Poland staged a tremendous recovery. He consolidated all of these almost innumerable Piast duchies, with the exception of Silesia, Pomerania and Pomerania. Kazimierz was an able administrator and forward-thinking politician. To rebuild his depopulated lands, he encouraged the immigration of foreigners, in particular of Jews, who had faced persecution in the wake of the Black Death. He codified the corpus of the existing laws and granted city rights under Magdeburg law. He launched a building program, which, along with the cathedrals of Gniezno and Krakow and churches all across the land, gave rise to 65 new fortified towns, the fortification of 27 existing ones and 53 new royal castles. He also rerouted the Vistula at Krakow and constructed a canal linking the salt mines of Bielicka with the capital. He reformed a fiscal system, with the central chancery allowing the kingdom to raise taxes. He introduced new coinage accepted across the kingdom, dramatically facilitating trade. And that trade was also supported by the banking skills of the Jewish immigrants, who were given a significant degree of fiscal and legal autonomy, which was the beginning of the Jewish culture that thrived for so long in the country. The country was booming. It also benefited from a dramatic improvement in the agricultural production. Now in the series about the Hanseatic League, we did talk about the hinterland of Danzig as a source of grain that fed Western Europe all the way to Spain and even at times Italy. 
importing vast amounts of grain became necessary for the major cities across Western Europe because the changing climate during the Little Ice Age that began around 1300 had reduced crops to the point that the land surrounding the cities could no longer feed the populations. Some argue that Poland, Prussia and Lithuania had benefited from a climate quirk that resulted in warming of this region while the rest of Europe became freezing. I find the evidence of that inconclusive. What is however quite likely is that the import of agricultural techniques from the West, the use of horse-driven plows, the three-field system, etc., led to material growth and productivity alongside with the conversion of forest and fallow lands into fields. Kazimierz also pushed for education. The University of Krakow was founded in 1364 after Prague, but before Heidelberg and Vienna. All this prosperity translated into increased military capability. Kazimierz did wage war against the traditional enemies of the Pias, namely the Bohemians over Silesia, and he did score a major victory in 1345. But his main interest lay to the southeast. The disintegration of the Kievan Rus had left a number of small principalities that looked extremely attractive. These were nominally under overlordship of the Mongols, but they too were on the retreat. Kazimierz took over the duchy of Halis, which is roughly modern-day western Ukraine, including Lviv and lands southeast from there. The kingdom of Poland under Kazimierz therefore ended up looking very different to today's Poland. It was a roughly 450 kilometers wide and 900 kilometers long stretch from Prussia to Moldova. Kazimierz the Great died in 1370. Though married four times, he had no children. So he gave his kingdom to his nephew, King Louis of Hungary. Louis himself came up to Krakow to be crowned, but left the country to be run by Elizabeth, his mother, the sister of Kazimierz. That Hungarian-Polish alliance lasted until the death of Louis, who in turn also had no male heir. His two daughters became Europe's most desirable bachelorettes. When Louis died, his older daughter Maria had married Sigismund of Luxembourg and was to inherit Poland, whilst the younger one, Hedwig, was to marry Wilhelm of Habsburg, who would then become king of Hungary. The Polish lords did, however, not agree with this. They did not want to be tied to the Luxembourgers who ruled Bohemia, so they brought her sister, Hedwig, or better known by her Polish name, Jadwiga, to Krakow and, in an act of inspired gender-bending, crowned her king, not queen, of Poland in 1384. Now the Habsburg prince she was initially betrothed to, and who she liked a lot, came to claim her, but the Polish lords locked up, first her and then him. After some toing and froing, the dejected Austrian prince gave up and returned home. At which point the question was who Jadwiga should marry, if not the Habsburg. The Poles had come up with the most unexpected idea. Jadwiga was to marry Jagiello, the Grand Prince of Lithuania. From a Polish perspective, that sort of made sense. After the southeast expansion of both Poland and Lithuania, the two realms shared a nearly 900 kilometer long border. Having rejected Sigismund and the Bohemians, who stood on the other side of that country, meant they were vulnerable to attack, with no one there to help. The main problem was, though, that Jagiello was still a pagan. The only way this marriage could go ahead was, the only way this marriage could go ahead was, if Jagiello would get baptized. As it happened, Jagiello was prepared to make that transition. The Lithuanians had spent the last 200 years defending their religion against the incursions of the Teutonic Knights, but they had also expanded far and wide into lands that had already become Christian. So their principality included not just pagans, but also Orthodox Christians, Latin Christians and Jews. Now, As part of an astute policy of playing one enemy against the other, the Lithuanians had often promised conversion or at least allowed missionaries to come in and proselytize. Hence, at the time Jagiello was made the offer of the hand of Jadwiga, Lithuania was no longer fully pagan. And Poland was an incredibly attractive opportunity. 
Thanks to Casimir's success as a ruler, Poland was incredibly rich and cultured as well as military capable. All he had to do was to get his head wet and build a cathedral, and all of this was his. So, no wonder he went for it. On February the 12th, Jagiello arrived in Krakow. Three days later, he was baptized. On the 18th, he married Jadwiga, and on March 4th, he was crowned King of Poland. So this is the beginning of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, at times the largest state in Europe, that at its height stretched all the way from Baltic to the Black Sea and from Krakow almost all the way to Moscow. For the Teutonic Knights, this was a major calamity. Their territory in Prussia was now surrounded on all sides by one hugely powerful neighbor. And not only that, the Lithuanians were no longer officially pagans, bringing down the whole edifice of the bulwark of Christianity that justified their existence. And with at least one side, the Lithuanians, the order was already in a state of continued low-intensity war. Relations with Poland weren't that great either. Initially, the Teutonic Knights and the Piast Dukes had a good relationship. After all, it was the Duke of Mazovia who had called them in for help. Many of the crusaders who came to conquer Prussia and suppress the revolts had come from Poland, and many Polish settlers had helped cultivating Prussian lands. Sure, there was occasional conflict, in particular with the Dukes of Pomerelia, with Svantopolk and Mestwin, who had played a major role in the Prussian uprising. But all in. It was the Teutonic Knights' interest that Poland was supportive, as the crusaders had to travel through Polish lands or into Danzig to get into Prussia. At the same time, the Prussian dukes relied on the Teutonic Knights' support, keeping their northern border safe from Lithuanian and Russian attacks. Things went pear-shaped, when Mestwin II, the last Duke of Pomerelia, died in 1294. Mestwin, like so many of his family, had no heirs, and so he made the King of Poland his heir, and that king was Ladislav the Short. That meant the land became part of the conflict between the Bohemian pretenders and Ladislav the Short. And when Ladislav the Short came back from exile in 1306, with Hungarian help, he also took Pomerelia, with its capital Danzig, back under his control. He placed the garrison into Danzig and then moved on to deal with other problems further south. In 1308, the Markgrafs of Brandenburg thought they had an opportunity to take the territory on some of these usual dynastic pretenses. They were successful and occupied almost all of the territory. The Hansa merchants of Danzig had opened their gates and the royal presence was now limited to Danzig Castle. The garrison asked Ladislav the Short for help, but he could not do much at this point in time. He suggested to ask the Teutonic Knights for support. In 1308, the Grand Master Heinrich von Plötzke heeded the call for help and took his army to Danzig, drove the Brandenburgers out. He did this in part of generally friendly relationship with the king, but also in the expectation to get paid, 10,000 marks specifically. The Teutonic Knights in Danzig were waiting for the money to arrive, but somehow the check got lost in the post. The citizens of Danzig, most of whom were German-speaking traders and artisans, did however not like their new occupiers very much. They had got used to a much higher level of autonomy than the Knights brothers would allow them. A revolt broke out that was brutally suppressed. How brutal is a big debate, though the claims of 10,000 dead made by later Polish rulers is very, very improbable. The suppression of the revolt did, however, not resolve the problem. King Ladislav the Short was still not prepared to pay. It wasn't just the lack of payment that irritated the knights so much. It was the assumption on the side of the king that he could just call upon the Teutonic knights whenever he wanted, as if they were his vassals. So, to make clear what was what, the Teutonic knights decided to stay. They bought the claims to Pomerelia that the Markgrafs of Brandenburg had, whatever they were worth, and they formed an alliance with them. Now they had a direct land bridge into the empire via the Duchy of Pomerania and Brandenburg, making them a lot less dependent on the Poles. Now this, as it turns out, was not just a crime. It was worse. It was a mistake. 
The disagreement over Pomeralia and the city of Danzig poisoned the relationship between the Poles and the Teutonic Knights that, when reading the commentary on my Facebook page, continues to this day. It also added to the pressure on the order in Avignon and their general reputation. In 1320 and in 1339, the Poles accused the order of unlawfully waging war against Christians. And quite frankly, the facts of the matter are quite clear. Taking a Christian land was not what a chivalric order was meant to do. The order lost both cases and was required to hand back Pomeralia to the Poles. The Grand Master refused and was excommunicated twice. But as it happened, pretty much all of the Empire was at the time under one interdict or the other, and the moral suasion of the Avignon Popes had nowhere near the weight of an innocent IV. So nothing came of it. Strategically, Pomeralia and Danzig in particular were extremely important to Poland. It was their access to the Baltic Sea. Danzig stands at the mouth of the great Polish river, the Vistula, where grain, wood, salt and metals were shipped to the markets of Flanders, England and Norway. The loss of Pomeralia pushed the Polish rulers into a closer relationship with the Lithuanians. Poles and Lithuanians realized they had common enemies, the Mongols and the Teutonic Knights. The very beginning of that alliance lay here in 1326 when Vladislav's successor, Kazimierz the Great, married Aldina, a famously beautiful Lithuanian princess. In response, the Teutonic Knights began a PR campaign against King Vladislav the Short, encouraging both external and internal enemies to topple him. One of these enemies was King John of Bohemia, the famous blind knight whose ostrich feathers and motto still grace the Prince of Wales's arms. War broke out in 1328, and Ladislav the Short attacked Kulm, whilst the Teutonic Knights were distracted by a large operation against the Lithuanians. In 1329, the order struck back, supported by the forces of King John of Bohemia. Ladislav the Short now allied with the Hungarians and Lithuanians, which led to a battle of Plovci in 1331. That battle, everyone agreed, was unusually fierce even for a period that was used to violence. Technically, Ladislav did win the battle and had 65 knight brothers executed. But when the Teutonic reinforcements arrived on the battlefield, the Poles fled home. Ladislav died shortly after in 1333, opening the room for negotiations. It took until 1343 before all parties involved, the knights, the kings of Poland, Hungary and Bohemia and the Grand Prince of Lithuania, could come to a solution. And that solution was a complex structure that maintained the notion that Pomerelia was still part of the Polish kingdom somehow, but that definitely the Teutonic Knights were in charge. Now after that, things calmed down for a very long time, pretty much until the marriage of Jadwiga and Jagiello in 1386. And that was a double blow to the Teutonic Knights. A Catholic Lithuania meant no more crusades and hence no more tourists and worse, no purpose for the organization. A combined Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth meant it was only a matter of time before there would come for the Teutonic Knights militarily. So the Knights pursued a twofold strategy to counter this threat. One was to claim that the Lithuanian conversion was a scam. Jagiello, they said, continued to worship his pagan gods and had not suppressed the pagan temples, which is probably true. The other part of the strategy was to exploit internal conflicts in Lithuania. Jagiello had a rival for the role of Grand Prince, Waitautas, the son of the previous Grand Prince who had been murdered by Jagiello. Waitautas had a strong following in Lithuania and with the order's support threw out many of Jagiello's vassals. Jagiello was reduced to the capital Vilnius and surrounding lands. In 1390, the Teutonic Knights, supported by Vytautas, attacked Vilnius. There was one of the very few Reisen that were actual proper military undertakings. It was also the fight that Henry Bolingbroke, the future King Henry IV of England, took part in. Vilnius held out for five weeks and, after the weather turned, the Crusaders had to give up. There were further major operations in the three years that followed, but it took until 1398 that both sides were ready to make peace. 
By that time it was Vytautas, not Jagiello, who was in control of Lithuania. Jagiello was king of Poland now, together with his wife. And when Jadwiga died in 1399, he became the sole ruler of Poland. As for Jagiello and Vytautas, they reconciled, but given their backstory, everybody believed they still mistrusted each other profoundly. The success of the Lithuanian campaigns and the split between Vytautas and Jagiello gave the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights, Ulrich von Jungingen, the impression that he was in a very strong position. Yes, the Crusades as such were over, and the support from the travelling knights could no longer be relied upon, but all in, the Knight Brothers were a superior force, easily able to take on the Poles and Lithuanians. And this is where we go from mistake to catastrophic mistake. What ended the ten years of relative calm was an uprising in Samogitia that the Teutonic Knights blamed on Vytautas. Ulrich von Jungingen demanded that Vytautas and Jagiello immediately ceased any further support to the Samogitian. That demand was seen as deeply insulting by both Poles and Lithuanians. In particular, the Poles had come to trust Jagiello over the last ten years and, contrary to expectations in Prussia, were willing to go to war for him. Things weren't improved when the matter was brought before King Wenceslas of Bohemia, who was asked to act as arbiter. Wenceslas sided fully with the order, adding more fuel to the flames. One-on-one -on -one meetings between Jagiello and Jungin also failed to resolve issues. The fronts are now firming up. The Lithuanians tie themselves to the Poles. War was coming again. Jagiello gathered his army in Plok, south of Kulm. One estimate said he gathered 18,000 Polish fighters and Vytautas brought him 11,000 men from Lithuania. These included not just Poles and Lithuanians, but also Bohemians and Moravian mercenaries, Tatars, Russians and Moldovians. Ulrich von Jungingen relied on only about 10,000 cavalry from the order, plus some support from the King of Bohemia and the last contingent of Crusaders, roughly 15,000 men in total. Now these numbers are, as always, quite inexact. What most estimates have in common, though, was that the Poles and Lithuanians outnumbered the order's forces two to one. That being said, the order operated as a close unit of men who had trained and fought together for a very long time, whilst Jagiello's forces were a wild mixture of who had little coherence, not even in weapons, training, tactics or even language. So, this was not a slam dunk. On July 2nd, 1410, Jagiello's forces crossed the Vistula River and began an invasion of Prussia. His army followed along the Dremens River, burning and plundering, as was the habit of medieval armies. Ulrich von Jungen, who had split his forces across the length of the frontier, now brought his men together in pursuit. When they came to the burning ruins of the town of Gilgenberg, the Grand Master lost his cool. The destruction he had witnessed along the way, and he feared would be inflicted on his lands if he did not bring this to an end quickly, urged him to double the pace and catch up with the Polish-Lithuanian forces. At a place the Germans called Tannenberg, the Poles Grünberg and the Lithuanians Salgiris, the two armies came together. As you would expect from a confrontation that has a mythical status in Polish, Lithuanian and in the past German consciousness, quite a lot of it is disputed. What is most likely is that at some stage in the battle, the Teutonic Knights meant for an all-out attack on the position where they assumed Jagiello was standing. This may have been triggered by a feigned retreat or an actual retreat or a simple misunderstanding. What we know is that the Teutonic Knights, led by the Grand Master Ulrich von Jungingen, charged at the Polish center, driving a wedge into the Polish-Lithuanian forces. This charge came as far as the royal bodyguard, but was held off. Meanwhile, forces commanded by Vytautas attacked the knight's flank. And the result was a massacre. The Grand Master and his chief officers lay dead. His army fled along the narrow pass through the forest and were killed one by one. 8,000 soldiers died that day on either side, 
which suggests that almost half the entire force of the Teutonic Knights had perished. Those who survived sought shelter in whichever castle they could find. News of the defeat spread through Europe and left people aghast. The mighty Teutonic Knights, whom many of Europe's aristocrats had met on their gap year and admired for their military skills, had been all but wiped out. How was that possible? And what is going to happen next? Will the order collapse? That is a story for another time, or next week to be precise, so I hope you will join us again. Ah, and by the way, just in case you cannot remember, my Patreon account is at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans, and for one-time donations go to historyofthegermans.com slash support. <laughs>